Will they or won't they? That is the question, or at least that's the question we're meant to ask because we're taught to believe that the Federal Reserve is the center of the, of the financial market universe. Therefore, anything the Fed does is of obscene importance to everybody else and everything else in the world. Now, that's true in a very narrow and limited sense, especially in the short run, when the Fed may be raising rates as it has been doing, and therefore it can influence other money market rates, though not as much as people may think, as we've talked about in recent episodes. However, the Fed does produce short-run influences on various asset markets, not just money market rates, but also short ends of yield curves, which we're going to get to in a very in a minute here, and also asset markets broadly, where sentiment is a major impact. If you thought stocks, you know, you wanted stocks were a good deal because Jay Powell was your best friend, and now Jay Powell says I'm no longer your best friend, you kind of look at those asset classes very differently, especially if there's other questions about what's going on in them. So will they or won't they? Will the Fed continue to hike rates? When will it pivot? What will happen when it does? Now the Fed says, forget about that pivot stuff. We're not gonna pivot at all. We're gonna continue hiking rates because we believe inflation is the greatest risk to the economy. Even though we can see all these softening warning signs, other things in the real economy that say, maybe things aren't going so well, but until we're convinced that either the recession is very real and very disturbing or consumer prices are coming down and going to stay down, Jay Powell has indicated numerous times they're going to continue hiking rates. And numerous times the market has said, we don't believe you. That's what curve inversions are all about. Now, some have argued that this is different especially compared to the very recent past, the last time we went through this in 2018 and 2019. But there's also other, uh, another historical analogy that we can draw, draw upon for somewhat of uh, experience, as well as an idea of what could happen when the Fed was more reluctant to lower interest rates. And we'll get into that in a minute, but first let's talk about curves. And if you're here, then you know that I'm Jeff, and this is Eurodollar University, where we talk about money and economics and the cross currents on a, a cross currents between both and how these things impact not just markets and investing, but everything else beyond it. So Eurodollar futures, Eurodollar futures. Let's do some initial review. Eurodollar futures, the curve, it had inverted, as I've said many, many times in June of 2018 at a time when Practically nobody thought that, that uh, lower interest rates were a possibility. The market inverted because of quite a few things. Um, talked about recently, collateral, Italy, uh, overseas, euro bonds, shortage, scarcity, those kinds of things that happened around May 29th of 2018. The market said, this sucker's breaking. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jay Powell, sounding a lot like he does today, said, no way. Inflation is our biggest risk. The growth, the economy in the United States is accelerating. It needs to be cooled down. We're going to hike rates, as, not just for the rest of 2018. We're going to continue hiking into 2019 and maybe, maybe even become more aggressive. And as the Fed continued along in that stance of hiking rates for the foreseeable future, the inversion in the euro dollar futures curve got worse until the end of the year where it just exploded. And of course, at the early part of 2019, the Fed did capitulate. At first, it said, no, we're not going to hike any more rates in 2019. Before, by, by July, they threw in the towel and actually cut rates, which is exactly what the market had been forecasting from the, a whole year earlier when everybody else said that this was impossible. Now, Fed proponents today say, throw out that example. The Fed was weak. The Fed was too focused on unemployment. The Fed was not, was not confronted with the consumer price situation that we find ourselves in today. Therefore, unlike 2019, the Fed will not just, easily, not just give up so easily. They're going to stick with rate hikes until they see consumer prices go down and stay down. That's the key difference. Unlike 2019 and 2022, we actually did get consumer prices and they got to be as high as we've seen in 40 years. In 2018, 2019, you had a modest acceleration, but it never really got that far because the system broke down, but also because the reason why consumer prices are rising in the first place. 
which makes this such a difficult situation to get to, to really guess and to really understand. Because think about what the Fed is saying. We're not going to we're not going to stop hiking rates until we see consumer prices go down. But consumer prices are not up because of economic reasons. They're up from largely political reasons. The economic reasons are being cleared up and they're being cleared up by a looming recession. We can all see it coming. You know, whether it's corporate anecdotes saying, hey, we've got way too much inventory, we're going to have to start slashing prices. We see it in shipping rates. The goods, fewer goods, are uh, shipping rates are collapsing because goods are not moving. We see it as in services. Services sentiment is poor, not just in the United States or Europe, but around the world. China, China never rebounded from Shanghai. So there's enormous number, a, a, a tremendous amount of information telling us the economy's poor. But as we see in Europe in particular, Prices remain high, especially energy prices, because it's not about economics. So it becomes very difficult to surmise what is what the Federal Reserve is going to do based on non-economic considerations. And that's what's going on in the front end of these curves, including Eurodollar futures. So the Eurodollar futures curve between mid-June mid -June and late July collapsed because the data started to go down. We had deflationary uh, outbreak in markets, you know, cur currencies uh, crashing against the US dollar, we had commodity prices falling, liquidations ev evident in a lot of markets, even stocks and digital currencies and things like that, which suggested, okay, here it comes. Here comes the bad stuff. And so the, the front end of the Euro dollar futures curve, like the treasury curve or even the German curves uh, in Europe, all said, okay, the circumstances have come about in the way that we expected them to. And so we expect the Fed to give up on the, give up on its rate hikes. But consumer prices didn't follow because of other reasons, non-economic reasons. The consumer price index in the United States, especially for the month of August, the, the data that was released in September, then you have the European consumer price indices, which have accelerated wildly, because again, non-economic reasons, and the market has to has to in interpret that data in the context of what the Fed is trying to do, which is hike rates for non-economic reasons. So that's really what's going on in the front end of these curves, trying to figure out how aggressive and how long each central bank can remain aggressive for reasons that have nothing to do with the economy. Why the account while the economy collapses around them, how long can they remain? isolated with this tunnel vision on consumer price indexes. That's really the game at the front end of these curves, which is why from July until recently, end of September, you saw the front end of the, all these curves steepen wildly. But, and here's the thing, the back end of these curves have not steepened. In fact, they've, they've remained inverted throughout because the market is saying, regardless of what the Fed does or the ECB or whatever central bank, the outcome is likely to be the same no matter what. The question isn't will they or won't they? The question still remains when will they? And then what happens in between that causes the when to take place? And so we look at the, the steepness in the front of the yield curve or the front of the euro dollar futures curve, and that makes perfect sense given what Jay Powell says, given the fact that CPIs are still relatively high. They haven't really been, uh, they haven't really come down yet because the full weight of the deflationary circumstances or the recession hasn't really hung, on, hung into consumer prices just yet. And so it's still a guessing game about when. We see that in the euro dollar futures market where the inversion has changed, which it does. It has changed all throughout the year. The euro dollar futures curve inverted all the way back last, last December for the first time, long before the Fed started rate hikes, long before the idea the Fed was going to be uh, really aggressive with those rate hikes. The market was already saying something is going wrong here or that's more likely to go wrong, meaning deflationary, than to go right in either recovery or continued consumer price acceleration. So that was December. And everything that has happened along the way has been the market pricing probabilities of how long and how, how, what, what the Fed will do in between that and now. That's really what happened 
uh, the, the inversion point has moved around. It started way out in the pa in the far down the curve in the December 2025 contracts. It initially, then it moved all the way up to the December 2022 contract, and then over the last month and a half, since late uh, two months, since late uh, July, the curve has then the inversion point moved back again. It moved from the December 22 contract to the March 23 contract, and even for a couple of days, the June 23 contract. And then over the last week, as we've seen some more data come in that's not good, as we've seen more indications, sulfur T-bills, swap spreads, a number of deflationary circumstances that suggest another outbreak, we've seen the inversion move back from the June 2023 contract to March 2023, and now again December. In fact, the December and the March 23 contract are sort of, sort of in a jockeying for which one is higher or lower. In other words, the market is still trying to figure out when the pivot happens, not if it will. And then, of course, we need to figure out what it means in between. So let's go back. OK, forget about 2018. Let's 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 give the Fed proponents the benefit of the doubt here and say, as the Fed has proven so far, they're not going to just give up and throw in the towel so easily like they did in 2019. But we also have a, a historical example that we can draw upon where the Fed was extremely reluctant to lower interest rates. Now they had given up on the rate hikes and it's questionable whether or not they were gonna go further. And I'm talking of course about 2004, 2005, 2006. Then of course the major events in 2007 and beyond. The Fed under Alan Greenspan began hiking rates in June of 2004 because, familiar story, they decided that inflation was the economy's greatest risk not the collapse of that whole housing bubble that everybody could see was going on. So Alan Greenspan, rates were as low as 1%. The Fed fund, back then there was only a target. The Fed funds target was 1%. And they began raising rates steadily a quarter, a quarter of a percent at every single meeting for 17 consecutive meetings. So between June of 2020, 2004 in June of 2006, two, uh, two years in between, 17 rate hikes totaling four and a quarter basis points. The Fed funds target went from 1% to five and a quarter. Now the question is, and we'll never know this for sure, I've never seen a definitive answer. I've seen both sides of the, in fact, they were debated on both sides as it was happening. But in June of 2006, you could already see Trouble, trouble, problems going on in the housing market as well as the economy and in the financial system. Yet inversions take shape, it, uh, euro dollar futures, treasury curve, all these things happen. And for whatever reason, whether the Fed thought that was enough or they started to get a little bit cautious, in 2006, they, and under Ben Bernanke, who finished up Alan Greenspan's rate hikes, they said, that was it. We're going to stop here. And for the next year and a half, the Fed stuck at five and a quarter while all of this other stuff went on. All of the fireworks that became the housing bubble and then the global monetary, not financial, global monetary crisis were priced into markets. But as we saw more and more, we got closer and closer and closer to the GFC, which is really GMC. The Fed said, no, we are not going to cut rates. We're going to continue to hold rates at five and a quarter percent no matter what. Subprime is contained, Bernanke said. Bill Dudley said, forget about euro dollar futures. That's just hedging. Well, yeah, that's just hedging. Hedging against reality. Hedging against things that are going wrong, that whether the Fed admits it or not, these things are happening. This should sound very familiar to us. The Fed said we're not cutting rates until they did. And they did cut rates just as the market had predicted because a whole series of bad stuff happened that by the time they did happen, August 9th and after in particular, it was so obvious that things were going wrong despite the fact the Fed did not want to cut rates. They said over and over, we are not going to cut rates. They cut rates. And then within two months after that, three months after that, they're auctioning off bank reserves, liquidity, TAF overseas dollar swaps, all those kinds of things. So those who argue that in 2022, the Fed's reaction function is the dominant feature, that's true only in the short run. The market has remained absolutely certain, this inversion. It's not a question of will they or won't they, it's still a question of when. And for us, which, makes, which matters more, 
what is it that happens between now and when that causes when to happen? And that's what we're seeing spread across markets, the dollar exchange value, which has gotten even mainstream economists' attention, and on and on and on. That's what all these things are about. And that's really what's happened in yield curves, bond curves, euro dollar futures curves. It's not about if, it's about when. And it's still about when even now. So thank everybody for watching. Appreciate it. Um, also, just a reminder, if you're watching this video on Emil's channel, you're going to want to go to the Eurodollar University channel because after a couple more weeks, those our videos were going to be posted exclusively at Eurodollar University's YouTube channel. You can find the link in the description. You can also search for it on YouTube. Also add, if, if you're watching this on Emil's channel, there'll, there'll be a link at the end of the video. As always, Thank you to Eurodollar University members. We'll scroll their names, some of their names, others people who remain, wish to remain private and anonymous, but the, those who don't, who are proud Eurodollar University members, we're happy to do it. We'll credit them at the end of the video. Check out Eurodollar.University for not just memberships, but also subscription services about research and information, what I'm doing with Stephen Van Meter and Tracy Schuchart, Markets Insider Pro, all that stuff, Eurodollar.University. Until next time, take care.